Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are late some five to ten minutes, but it's never too late to start talking yet again for so many years about the EU uh, enlargement processes and everything which is on this very ancient agenda that we are going to fulfill until in the next one and a half hours, hopefully. Uh, my name is Sasha Ranski. I'm a journalist for, well, I'm sorry, for more than 35 years, so, you know, that says everything, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, we are going to implement, I have to explain uh, very shortly, uh, what is the model of the discussion that we are going to implement. It is called the fishbowl discussion, which means that we will start with our respected uh, six guests here and, and opening speakers, and then we have an empty chair. So whoever wants to join the discussion, have questions or whatever, please come to the chair. Then some of our guests will stand up, will leave the uh, podium, they will go back, then there will be another empty chair, so we are trying to change. This is a direct democracy model. The idea is that the discussion is alive, that everyone participates, that there is no kind of blockage and uh, kind of uh, podium ramp between the audience and the participants. We are going to try that technique. It's going to be complicated, but I'm encouraging you to to move. This is a movable model. I have problems with moving because it opens my appetite, Tim, as you know, and you can see that I'm moving a lot in my life, but we'll try it. Okay, uh, I think that we, 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 will, we will try to, uh, in a way, promote this model as really a good one. Uh, the, the concept of this is, of course, a gold uh, uh, golden fishes model. We have golden fishes which are participants here in our bowl, and then some of those golden fishes are going to leave the podium, others will come, and we'll see how this develops. Now, the title of our panel today, of our discussion debate, is The Road to EU. What to expect when you're expecting? Uh, some of you may know that there is a very famous uh, pregnancy guide with the same title from the mid-80s, what to expect when you're expecting. And there was a follow-up, a movie follow-up in 2012, uh, uh, a romantic comedy which was very popular in those days, and which is, of course, about uh, uh, pregnancy couples, five of them, which are then discussing, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, problems that they are facing with uh, kids which are going to come soon. So, uh, we have a pregnancy problem here uh, in our situation, Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, and not only was. We are pregnant for more than 15 years uh, because we became a candidate country for the EU in 2005. That was the government of Mr. Buczkowski, another social democratic government. And the most pregnant person in this, in this panel is, of course, uh, Mr. Nikola Dimitrov because he is leading the... He is leading the, yes. Let me just shortly introduce all of you, and then I would ask everyone who, who wants to join just to say in one sentence who or she or he is, and then just to proceed with the questions or comments. So we have the most pregnant person, uh, Mr. Nikola Dimitrov. He is the vice president of Macedonian government in charge of the European integration, a portfolio that in various capac capacities he is fulfilling for the more than two decades, three decades, who knows? I, I, even I forgot that, <laughs> that Nicola. Then we have uh, Ms. Tanya Fayon, who is a well-known member of the European Parliament, uh, Slovenian with a social democratic background. She's also very outspoken whenever the region is in question, and, and, and I, I hope that we are going to hear that voice yes, yet again this morning from that perspective. Uh, we are going to have Ms. Corina Stratulatu, which is going to be on a video because she couldn't come. She is, uh, she is a policy analyst at the European Policy Center. And as a last speaker, we are going to uh, include her to the, through the video connection. Uh, then we have uh, Ed Joseph, a well-known friend. I mean, uh, I'm not even going to describe you the ads traveling, uh, Tim Judas traveling, Ervan Fuera is traveling, yes, of course, from Ireland to Macedonia. How many planes, how many buses, how many certificates, this and that. We're going to spend the whole panel if we try to describe that. And for that, I personally thank you. Because, you know, to take this opportunity to come to the, from the United States, where, the, uh, where Ed Joseph is coming from, is a really a big endeavor. Thank you very, very much, Ed, for that. And Ed is a senior fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relation coming from Washington yesterday. Still jack-lagged or? Uh, doing okay. 
Okay. The Ohrid air. Done okay. Cures, <laughs> it's a cure for jet lag. That's always a good thing. <laughs> right. Then we have Mr. Jacques Maire, who is a member of the French Assembly. He's also a vice chair of the Committee for International Relations in the French Parliament. Uh, he's, he's a good fellow with the French president, if I may say so. So I, I'm, I'm expecting a very important inputs from French perspective about the topics that we are going to discuss. We have uh, also Eva Cvetkovska. Eva is a student. We have uh, 10 students on this panel in the audience. Five of them are from Greece, five from Macedonian, Northern Macedonian universities, I'm sorry. And Eva is representing the, uh, the biggest state universities and Kyrgyz and Methodius from Skopje. She's also president of the student assembly at the university. Hi, Eva. You are the youngest person here, so don't worry. <laughs> and at the end, of course, we have Tim Judah, a famous British reporter covering the Balkans for, for, for many years. And, and his insights in the region are always very valuable, especially when printed in The Economist, which, of course, is one of the leading papers in the, in the region. So, uh, not to take too much time from the, from the agenda, I would like to invite Mr. Nikola Dimitrov to start with this. We are going to have five to seven, seven minutes of introduction, speeches of all participants, and then we are starting the dialogue. Two to three minutes I will tolerate and for, until four minutes. Uh, because we want to end this in some organized way until the, the, the end of the, of the session. So, Mr. Dimitrov, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to this discussion. I am new to the format, Everyone this fishbowl. Yep. So bear with me if I make a mistake. I'll try to be brief and not do what usually politicians do. They say, I'm going to be brief, and they talk for more than 30 minutes. The, usually when at conferences like this, people start by saying, a friend of mine yesterday told, told me this, this is great timing for a conference on the European future of this region. The topic in many ways of, of, of this uh, first gathering in, in Ohrid, although under Prespa, uh, that name, that symbol. But frankly, and I think we have to be honest and open, in order to even attempt to resolve problems, uh, it's, uh, it's the worst timing possible. Because only a few days ago, for the second time, Bulgaria vetoed the start of the accession talks uh, with us, uh, North Macedonia, affecting also our neighbors and friends in Tirana, Albania. The region is not in a good spot. Uh, we've talked about perspectives and the European future as back as Thessaloniki 2003, when the promise was given to the region. From our perspective, you have to understand us. We don't even know whether to expect it anymore. Uh, it's been two decades since we signed the Association and Stabilization Agreement. We did it even before Croatia. Croatia this year marks eight years of membership. We haven't started the journey. The big anchor used to be the dispute with Greece. That we resolved with the PRESPA agreement. Then we had two years over the reform of the accession process itself. And now we have a different challenge. The problem with this latest challenge is um, the subject matter. The subject matter is identity and history. Um, now, People ask me, is being a member of the European Union a license to bully or even a license to kill? <laughs> Can a member state demand, for instance, half of our territory? Can they ask whether um, we could abolish media freedoms? This sounds contradictory, and I'm using these exam examples to set light on the contradiction that we have, for instance, challenging uh, the challenge on the Macedonian language. We were able to resolve the name dispute only because Greece accepted the right of self-determination of our people. And we speak the Macedonian language. The question of the language is a question for the people here, not for any other country, not for any other international organization. So if the European Union 
is not only an economic giant, but it is also leading by example the narrative of values. And if in the Lisbon Treaty, member states are committed to protect and foster the linguistic and the cultural diversity on the European continent, then it is not European that we have as an obstacle the paragraph in the negotiating framework, which is usually a very technical one, that says uh, the acquis will be translated into the Macedonian language and North Macedonia should have enough interpreters and translators by the time of full accession. This has become an issue and I claim that our struggle is not only a struggle for the right thing, is not only a struggle for the Macedonian identity, but it is also a struggle for European identity. For that narrative of values that Europe should lead by example. We are a region that is geographically encircled by member states. We clearly understand the point that President Macron made uh, when, when he said we need to reform. We see the difficulties in the decision making of the European Union. At the same time, it is obvious that this region must become part of the Union. Geographically, economically, uh, historically, politically, we are in that boat. When the migration crisis started, the so-called Balkan route clearly illustrates why this region is an inter integral part of European security. The biggest issue I have, maybe gov governments come and go, we are replaceable, but the biggest problem that the European Union faces in this region today is uh, the l losing trust of the people of the region, of the citizens, that this is actually serious, that this is possible, and that they can trust and rely upon the Council declarations and the, the words of the European leaders. So we are at this stage now. And if the European Union cannot make a difference in this region, which is a court right, it's not even a backyard, because we are not on the outer border of the European Union. We are surrounded by member states. In the courtyard, if it cannot make a difference, it is telling of the problem that the EU faces, and it is telling about us. Um, the long-term consequence will be weakening of those who believe in the transformative power of the accession process, weakening of those who believe in the European values. Uh, so I think the stakes are quite big at, at, at this moment. Uh, with all our deficiencies and mistakes that we do as a government in the last four years, clearly we made a U-turn. The democratic score of North Macedonia is uh, progressing. The latest Freedom House report shows that we are in an increasingly small group of countries that marked progress. The decliners group is much bigger. We solved uh, the name dispute with, with leadership, with vision about the future, not only because of the start of this European journey, but also because of that as well. So I think this is, this is my uh, pitch to try to inspire a, a big debate, which I hope will be dynamic and will be open uh, to respond to the title in a way, what to expect when you're expecting. In the, in the last days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was a saying, the situation is hopeless, but not desperate. <laughs> In a way, people became complacent, came to terms that uh, it's, it's difficult to, to achieve progress, and that's that. Now, um, the big problem here is, if we don't have hope, it is difficult to continue to try. If we don't try, we will not achieve. On the other hand, if we are hopeful, this extends to the people and they're disappointed. 
and the nation cannot go through another cycle of disappointment. Whether it was uh, the candidate status, 2005, the first recommendation of the Commission, we are ready to start uh, 2009. June 2018, Europe said, we trace the, the, the path for you to start accession talks by June 2019. In June 2019, Europe said, we will decide in October. Finally, a decision was made in March 2020, and now for almost a year and a half, we cannot see this decision translated into reality. So we are today at a very difficult spot. We don't have the right to give up, in particular from making our nation more European. Only this Tuesday, the government adopted the revision of the national program of the adoption, for the adoption of the acquis. That we have to do, bring Europe here. But it will be good if we have some help by way of the accession process, which is created to help countries to transform. So I think we all bear a responsibility to try to fix a process that historically proved to be so important for this vision of Europe whole and free. I'll stop here to keep my promise. <laughs> uh, in, in the movie, I mentioned Cameron Diaz and Jennifer Lopez, among others. Act. Okay. I think that you were on the level of Cameron Diaz, Mr. Vilesta, so very good. <laughs> Ms. Fayon, uh, Mr. Dimitrov was, was talking about the narrative of values and how the hope is so important for the people in, in, the, in, the, in the avenue of joining EU. Can we today talk about the narrative of values uh, mm -hmm. in the European Union, not only even okay. toward the, the, the region? Thank you. I, I see and completely understand where are you heading? What are you focusing on? And uh, we certainly have to speak about the values. When it comes to the European Union, certain countries that are breaking the values, and how then to keep the trust in the region when you see what is happening and going on in some countries about democracy, rule of law, or freedom of the media. Um, I'll come at the beginning when the minister said it's maybe the worst timing. I would say, I mean, it's maybe a little bit at least symbolic element in today's day because um, Slovenia took over the presidency to the EU. I won't say that I have high expectations, but at least one thing I am positive that they put Western Balkan one of the priorities. Whether we'll see some good results depends on all of us. Um, yesterday, when I was driving to Ohrid with my friends, we discussed how sincere shall we be today in today's discussion. I mean, we see a lot of familiar faces, we discuss about the enlargement in same um, spots or region or among same friends for, I don't know, at least me 10, 15 years. And we discuss same topics, so it's difficult today to be innovative or a, a bit out of the box to say what can we expect. Because to be frank, the region is in a bad condition, the enlargement <coughs> is in a bad condition, and the EU is also in a bad condition. Maybe, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I share frustration that people in North Macedonia or in Albania or in Kosovo or other parts of the region feel today. It's really a shame to speak for so many years for countries such as North Macedonia, whether after 15 years we are still able to open, only to open the negotiations. And here I have to be critical, of course, to um, the side of the EU leaders or the governments that we really did a lot of promises in the last few years. Um, I remember I was a reporter for visa liberalization for Kosovo in 2018. We adopted, we gave the green light. It's three la years later, we are not discussing it anymore. So how can people trust? It's the same with North Macedonia. We gave several times green light, also in the European Parliament, how people can trust. 
the same goes to Albania and so on. And then we try to develop different tools, change a bit the process, start talking politically, less technically. It's not only the opening and the closing of the chapters, how to make it tangible for citizens to believe. Um, it doesn't really help. So when I say that it's a bad condition on all sides, I see a big challenge for us is trust. Trust in the region, trust in the politicians, in the institutions, in what are we promising. In our region, if I say Slovenia, part of this um, southeast region, we have full of emotions. We can really love each other, we can hate each other, but I think we have really something in common. We are part of Europe, we'll always be part of Europe, and this is something that connects us. Just look young people. Today, everyone would like to travel to the western part of Europe, and they are doing so because they lack vision at home. Um, again, a friend from Tirana yesterday told me in Albania, young people or in North Macedonia are going to, to western Europe to study, to get job opportunities, to stay there. Who is staying in these countries here are maybe people out of mic, yeah, okay. okay, or political elites or corrupted elites or, you know, people that can somehow survive. And this is not the future for this region we want. And this is our common responsibility. A lot is at stake. So I don't want to say enlargement is that because this would be too dangerous to say. But we have to be realistic. How can we do a better future to speak with the realistic language that people will really understand us? We have a lot of benefits. It's not only about European funds or cooperation, fighting against common challenges, but also making new opportunities for the region. I mean, if we fight corruption, if we fight um, organized crime, if we try to establish rule of law or democracy, we will also attract foreign investment, quality foreign investment, open job possibilities, give perspective for young people. And this is what we are doing with the enlargement process. And this is what we have to convince our European governments. Because the future for us is that we have a strong, united Europe. And this I strongly believe in, still nowadays. Because also young people are sending us this message. They want to stay in Europe. They want to stay at home. And they want to have job opportunities and education opportunities back at home. So these are huge challenges for us. And if most probably nowadays you would ask European citizens how do they feel about enlargement, most likely you would get a worrying or worrisome answer. Same with the governments. So it's good to be frank, but um, I really wish and I hope that the Commission and the institutions realize that enlargement is extremely important for us. What is happening is um, in the last years, a lot of selfishness, a lot of egoism, also this dangerous nationalism that is drifting us all apart. And this is also a danger for, for the Western Balkan. So my ambition is that Slovene presidency would, till the end of this year, what at least they try to promise, and I hope they will deliver, together with the EU governments, of course it's not only in the hands of the Slovene government, um, to open or start accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania, also deliver finally a visa for Kosovo and do little steps when it comes to negotiations with the other countries. We have to put aside this selfishness or these political topics that are like Bulgarian veto. This is for me too dangerous and too selfish for a country to jeopardize the future of uh, another country in the region. Finally, these are neighboring countries, they will have to live and they live together. So I will stay cautiously optimistic because if you are pessimist or if you um, share frustrations too often, um, you don't resolve the problems or the challenges. So we have to stay optimistic and we have to work together. We have to give this optimism to our citizens. It's our responsibility and we have to find a solution for that. Thank you.
Uh, well, thank you for being radical. Staying optimist these days is a radical option in, in our radical. circumstances. <laughs> okay. And thank you while talking about the values and deliveries. Uh, maybe Macedonian government, I see some other ministers in the hall here. We should start delivering by cleaning the Straja mountain passage. When you come to Skop, from Skopje to Ohrid, there is so much garbage there that when you see the, our European intentions and you see the garbage that the government is not, or the local government is not able to clean it, then we also have something to deliver for our young generations, I guess. And Eva is the representative from the, for the, from the young generations. And Eva, what do, you, what do you say about these politicians talking about the future values, optimism, and, and you know, delivering to the young generations? Well, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Eva Cvetkovska. I am the president of the University Students Assembly at the University in Skopje. But I'm not here to just represent the voice of the students, but rather the voice of the young people in the Republic of North Macedonia. I believe that it is high time that the young people are invited and involved in these kinds of discussions where we are giving the opportunity to raise our voices and give our opinion on political decisions which uh, at the long term affect exactly us, the young people. So, uh, most young people, including myself, believe and firmly, firmly trust in the idea of uh, the, the European Union. And by that I mean the European values uh, such as the rule of law, democracy, the protection of the fundamental human rights, and uh, so on. And so in that manner, I think that uh, we should continue to fight for the European idea and the European ideals. Some would say that um, the idea is just an illusion and it, that it's just a, a geopolitical uh, game that somebody is playing. But even though that might be true to some extent, that, that, that does not mean that we should give up on, on the ideals of the European Union. And we should continue to fight for uh, what we have inherited as um, a civilization and what we have inherited as people of this continent. So um, I think that the core philosophical uh, dimension of the, the unity that the, the, and the shared values that the uh, European Union um, presents us is the thing that mobilizes the people. And we should fight for that. And uh, in this manner, I think that by trusting in it and fighting for it, we are fighting the bad guys. And uh, by the bad guys, I mean the extremist far right and uh, the, um, the nationalistic and populistic uh, options which are served to us and which are taking over the narrative. So we should uh, become active stakeholders in the fight against that. And we should uh, come back to the roots and uh, bring back the trust in the people that uh, democracy and rule of law and the protection of human rights uh, can, be, uh, can be protected and... Um, and yeah. Guaranteed, yeah. Guaranteed, yes. Uh, and by saying I believe and I trust in the uh, European idea, I do not uh, mean masochistically and uh, blindly uh, being led by it. Uh, I think that we should let ourselves be Eurosceptic and critical since um, a critical reassessment of uh, situations and stuff is one of the core uh, European values. So the most European gesture I can give today is being critical towards the inconsistency of the European uh, Union to, towards the, uh, the proclaimed uh, European values and its promises. And in that manner, I would like to address the dispute with uh, our neighbor, Bulgaria. And um, I think that it, it can be uh, resolved in a, a constructive dialogue. Uh, we have a par excellence uh, example of a political gesture which we had with the PRESPA agreement in which the two sides were equal sides uh, of a constructive and rational dialogue and the source of ideas. And uh, I think that uh, some, there are some boundaries to what can be discussed about and what cannot be discussed about. And I think that uh, a cultural heritage and the right to self-determination and uh, to, to language is something that cannot be put up for discussion. So in that manner, I think that the European Union should 
uh, in a way help us and uh, protect what is uh, what proclaims to be a core value of the European Union. Do you think Union. that they're doing that their job in that sense, in the in the sense that you are talking? Is the European Union actually enough investing energy and? In, into this process, even with Bulgaria now? Well, what's, your, no. what's your impression? No, that's why I'm addressing this issue, because I think that the European Union should be consistent towards its values and what it proclaims to be a European value. So, uh, and plus, um, more so, uh, I would like to add that uh, the European Union should invest more in what is uh, its promises and uh, to, because the people in North Macedonia are starting to lose hope and what we've worked for and what we've compromised upon um, is starting to lose sense. So, uh, nationalistic uh, narratives and um, euroscepticism is starting to, to rise. And so, in that manner, yes, uh, what I'm expecting is constructive dialogue and, uh, yes, consistency with the core. So, and the last uh, issue I would like to address is um, about the European uh, enlargement process and um, in, in the aspect of uh, working globally towards um, toward global to, towards global uh, problems, so in that manner, I would like to um, refer to um, a story from uh, Harari. He wrote, uh, he wrote in one of his books, where he compares this today's situation with. Uh, the past, the people from the past. The people from the past used to live in small tribes, shoulder to shoulder, in a constant conflict with each other by the rivers. And their sustenance and uh, their whole lives were completely dependent on, uh, on what the river gave them. So when natural catastrophes started to occur, the only way for the people to conquer uh, what the nature gives them is for them to unite and to start controlling the river in, instead of the river controlling them. So, uh, when putting this in today's context, uh, I would like to call for, the, uh, for global action and uh, against climate action and air pollution, which are things that, uh, which are global problems and we cannot, uh, we cannot resolve locally. So, Western Europe is not uh, an isolated entity from the Western Balkans. We are all a part of the, the European continent and I think that we should act uh, accordingly and globally. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Eva. Uh, <laughs> Tim, you were doing a long stream of articles on the demography on, on the Balkans, and, and uh, these were very eye-opening articles, if, if I may say. And Tim, we are losing these young, bright, young people, they are living and, and the hope is getting... Well, leaving, it's uh, people having uh, less children as well. Yep. But that's not a problem just for North Macedonia, that's a, or, the, or the Western Balkans, that's a problem for the whole of Europe. But it's, it's a fundamental problem for the whole of, of Europe in a way, if uh, uh, one side of Europe compensates for not having enough children by importing uh, uh, young people from, from North Macedonia, etc. So that's something which should definitely be thought about in, when we talk about the future of Europe. Um, uh, actually, I want to say that I think I was ended up on this panel by, by mistake. Um, I, I found that I was here by reading the agenda. <laughs> Lucky and mistake. then I thought, oh, I didn't know I was doing this. Um, and I would have said, I don't know what I'm going... Uh, if I had been... If there had been a discussion, you know, I would have said, no, this is like... Uh, I don't have anything new to say. I mean, what, what is there new to say? And then I thought, no, I should, perhaps that's what I should say. I mean, it is difficult. And Tanya has been kind of polite and put everything in a polite fashion. But, uh, you know, after 15 years, you know, what is there new to say? We do keep repeating uh, the same things. We say, well, there's no alternative. Um, and if it's not the EU, then others will interfere in the region, uh, malign actors, which, which of course, which of course they are, and you know we need to do this. Uh, we need to we need to do this. Um, uh, we need to do EU enlargement not for not just for the sake of joining the EU, but for sort of modernising our own countries. And, and that that's all true, but you know here we are, 15 years later, and we're still saying the same things, and and and, and we're not we're not moving. Um, I mean, what's quite striking to me is actually this map. I don't know, if you're watching online, you may not be able to see it, but there's a map which comes up um, on, on the screens here. With the red um, area of the Western Balkans, definitely. Well, I, I actually, well, you're, that's the way that you look at it from here, 
But, you know, I'm coming from London and Britain has simply yes, disappeared. Yes. It's like, just not there. <laughs> okay. So, but you, so you're not seeing that. You're not seeing that. That's but, true. But, the, but no, but, but the, the point is, my, my point is that the whole of Europe is changing. The EU and, 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 and the EU is, is changing. And, and, and Europe is changing. And... You know, these processes take a, a, a long, a Switz long... Switzerland is also... Up Switzerland is not there, and, and Norway's not, <laughs> not there either. I mean, I, I know that, but, but the point is that Switzerland and, and Norway were never there. Yeah, that's true. That hasn't changed. What has changed is that Britain has, has fallen off the map. Mm. I mean, literally, has just sort of vanished into the, <laughs> uh, vanished into the, into the North Sea. So my point is... Uh, that you know increasingly the problem is not the problem is not here i mean the problem is, is the problems are within 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 the eu and we used to talk about oh the the Europeanization of the Balkans. And in the last few years, I've been repeating this ad nauseum. The problem is increasingly the Balkanization or adopting of Balkan standards in parts of the EU. Um, we've seen, for example, um, the revelations in Sofia in Parliament about just how Bulgaria has been run um, over, the, over the last uh, few years. Um, uh, then we've got um, the you know, regression in terms of... Uh, 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 of, of media, of law in in Poland, in Hungary, and um, uh, other countries uh, as well. And you know, one country, Bulgaria, can of course hold up uh, to much to the rage of everybody else in the EU about uh, you know North Macedonia and, and Albania's accession. And these things are kind of not really tenable. I mean, it's 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 not a useful way to um, to, to to run the continent. And clearly, uh, we're going to have to. To find new ways to run the continent and you know that is a challenge for the future i mean it's not just talking about the same things and kind of western balkans joining yes yes i mean that's kind of that's kind of obvious but the question is how will the western balkans fit in uh, a europe which will be different in 10 years time and we don't know what the difference is and actually nikki you said something kind of interesting you were saying about how the we don't really know this fishbowl concept is new blah, blah, blah. The maybe. whole of Europe is going to be a kind of, in 10 years' time, maybe is going to be a kind of fishbowl context, concept, concept, in the sense that this is the... Today, we're talking... A, today, this is the, the, the Euro countries, or the Schengen countries, or the, this, the, the group of this countries. And here's the group which also includes the UK and also includes Turkey. We, we don't know what the future of Europe is. Uh, uh, and, and that's why it's a kind of moving target Sometimes these discussions about oh the future of the Western Balkans and, and, and the EU is as though like the EU is going to be the same in ten years. But now the EU, as I've said, Britain has simply vanished into the North Sea. The, Bulgaria, uh, Poland, Hungary are all they're, they're, they're different countries from the way they were ten years ago. So in ten years, they the EU will be will be different. And 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 the fact of what's happening in Poland and Hungary uh, and maybe Bulgaria will provoke change, or is certainly provoking discussions of change within 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 the EU. And sooner or later, there has to be a kind of new, proper, serious adult relationship with the UK. So the future. I mean, yes, everything has to continue. Everything has to be, you know, in terms of, in, of enlargement. But it's, it's a moving target because you don't know what you're enlarging to. But, I mean, it doesn't mean everything has to stop. Everything still has to, has to continue. And everything has to, be, everything has to be done. But what sort of Europe we're, we're going to or, or the Western Balkans are going to, well, we don't know. And that's part of the, part of the problem, I suppose. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we lost an important uh, member of the EU, British, but we are still having the most important member of the EU, the Americans. And Ed Joseph is coming from Washington, and I'm sure that he will uh, put a very important light on all this discussion from the American perspective. Absolutely. I'll give you American perspective. But first, I have to apologize to those behind me for the fishbowl, and no disrespect to those I give my back to. Um, but, uh, and let me, Open with that, Sasha. And if I go on a little bit longer, maybe you'll indulge me 
because we go back a long time and I came a long way, as, as, you, <laughs> as you said. So let, if I go over a little bit. Uh, Please do. Uh, uh, well, thank you. So we, we just said, I just said to no disrespect. And let me, talk, let me open and talk about that word, respect, because everybody wants it. Every country wants it. You know, we talk a lot about Russia, malign actors. Russia, a lot of the motivation is respect. We need to be part of it. Macedonians want respect. European Union wants respect. Everybody wants respect. I come from a, a very big country uh, that is a very powerful country. And we typically don't have to worry about that, but people in this region do. And let's face it, uh, North Macedonia is a small country. Many Americans don't really know about it. They know very little about the region. But I want to tell you, Americans respect North Macedonia for what it has done, walking the walk, doing the hard things to preserve its dignity, its national identity, and make peace with its neighbors. And I want to acknowledge the great work here of now Deputy Prime Minister, but then Foreign Minister Nikola Dimitrov, together with his counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Kutsias, and their visionary Prime Ministers, Zaev and Tsipras, who did and walked the walk and showed that in this region, showed everybody that even these very difficult, highly neuralgic issues, ethno-national divisions, history, very difficult, sensitive issues can be resolved. All it takes is goodwill and vision. And I will tell you, Nicola, people in the U.S. respect North Macedonia and respect Macedonians because of the work of Nikola Dimitrov and his co counterparts and colleagues. And I'll give you a proof. You say, oh, he's just talking. <laughs> Our current president, Joe Biden, last August, as candidate, in the middle of a political campaign, acknowledged and uh, saluted Macedonians on the uh, anniversary of the Elinden uprising. And let me tell you, I'm not sure that would have happened had Prespa uh, not happened. And it was a sign of respect. And I can tell you, President Biden knows uh, what um, North Macedonia has done and is aware of that, and I'm sure of that, and he showed that. Now, let's talk about respect from the European Union standpoint, uh, from uh, the view of an American. And I take the point here, and I think it's time all of us, Americans are known for speaking plainly, and I think uh, after 20 years here since uh, Ocrit Agreement, and so uh, in this region, having seen this losing its way rapidly, we have, to be, we have to be frank, we have to be candid, and it's the time for platitudes. There's been many of these conferences, many platitudes about the vision, and we need to stop talking about the vision and the platitudes, and we need to start talking about the reality. So what about the respect for the European Union? I'm sorry to say that the respect we have for North Macedonia is not shared in the U.S. for the European Union. And and let's talk about the fundamentals of the American perspective on the Balkans. The U.S. never wanted to be the leader in this region. From the beginning, from George Bush Sr., never wanted to take on this role, never wanted to, oh, we need to be ahead of the Europeans. It was only because of European divisions during the, the wars that the U.S. got involved, and it was then Senator Joe Biden, among others, who, who saw that. And I have to tell you, that so many years later, uh, it's, there's simply not the respect for the European Union. And I will say this, if there are media here, you want a, a quotable line, I will say this. The EU cannot be a world power until the EU takes the Balkans seriously. And I, so it's not even just solving, resolving, in, until the EU takes it, the Balkans seriously, it cannot be, the EU cannot be taken seriously. And it isn't taken seriously, and I'm sorry to say that, because the EU is our ally. So this is not something I say with happiness as an American. The EU is our ally. We need to, a strong EU that addresses its problems in order to confront our 
adversaries and confront our global challenges. So it's not something I say in some way to put down the EU, I say it with uh, sadness. But the EU has failed and continues to fail. And I, you know, I, I can say that out loud. I'm not here as a, an American diplomat. And what we see, the, the EU, there's a lot of talk here, platitudes I, I've heard this morning about uh, ownership and people to take ownership. The EU has to take ownership. And including the ownership of the failure of the region's leaders to not take ownership. So when we have, for example, corruption in the region, look what the U.S. has just done. Just sanctioned in Bulgaria, put sanctions there. Uh, President Biden has just expanded the executive order that allows uh, sanctions to be put on for corrupt leaders. Just sanctioned these uh, in a significant way in Bulgaria. We can, U.S. can easily share that evidence with European Union. And if, even if the European Union as a whole cannot sanction because of whatever, uh, these divisions. Individual European countries can. Germany could. Uh, Netherlands. Others who, who make corruption. Netherlands made corruption a big issue with Albania. Okay? Join the U.S. in, in making sanctions of these leaders. Now, this can be done. Uh, the, the second point I want to say about the European Union and respect is that to fail to honor what a country does, and like North Macedonia, when it does what it is asked, not capitulate, but negotiate. Negotiate and preserve the dignity of its people as the Greeks negotiate and preserve the dignity of their people. When it does what it is asked, and the European Union doesn't follow through the first time, as happened in 2019 when France uh, blocked North Macedonia from opening, that is correctly, as it was called, a historic mistake. When it does it a second time, uh, as is now with the situation with Bulgaria, that's a betrayal. That's a betrayal. And it is a betrayal of European values, and, it, and it's a betrayal of any type of respect you, that you want from Americans, and the nature of the, quote, partnership with the European Union over the Balkans, it's, it's a betrayal of that. And, and the idea that the EU is going to take over the Balkans and, and continue this path, it's, it's a farcical. And the notion that the EU is going to develop, quote, strategic autonomy from the US. Imagine, think about it, if you were a, uh, an Israeli or a Palestinian or an Afghan and some of the EU say, oh, we're going to come, we, we have strategic autonomy from the US. You know what my answer would be is if I were one of those? You deal, you get uh, North Macedonia into the EU first. You sort out Kosovo first. You deal, you can't even deal with Bosnia. So how are you going to deal with us in, in it with our problems here? That, and, and if the EU aspires to that, and that's the vision, strategic autonomy, we're a rival, we're a world, world power. You have to uh, sort out these problems. And this is my third point. They are soluble. These problems in the region are soluble. It's, oh, it's so difficult. Kosovo is so difficult. Bosnia is so, it is not. It is not that difficult. It's not simple. It's not easy. But uh, Nikola and his counterparts proved it can be done. The key condition, the key condition is that the European Union is unified with unanimity or even approaching a unified position in the EU. All these problems are resolvable. I don't have time to explain all of this today. I've written about this. I have a piece in the Wilson Center, Edward P. Joseph Wilson Center, recently in Foreign Policy. If you Google that, you can see. I don't have time here to explain. But that's all it takes. And uh, I want to, because we're in North Macedonia, I want to focus here. I won't say too much about um, the wider issues, Kosovo and Bosnia, et cetera. We'll focus here on this, uh, our uh, gracious host. And let me say this about European values. What, what is one of these big European values? Are there American values now? We, we see this a lot of talk about uh, LGBTQ, right? What is that about when we say that? LGBTQ, and, and, and we, have, uh, we defend the rights of transgender and gay and lesbian. What is that all about? It's about uh, acknowledging the dignity and the identity 
sexual identity, the gender identity of people, that they can choose their gender identity. Now, why are those same values not applied to national identity? So, on what basis is a European Union country allowed to tell, if, if, at the same time, embracing all of these LGBTQ values, which is great, on what basis is a European, one European Union country allowed to tell an aspirant what their identity is? You are not actually Macedonians. You're really Bulgarian. Your language is really Bulgarian. You, by what basis? How is that reflecting European Union values? It isn't. As long as Macedonians do not say to Bulgarians, you're really Macedonian. We, we have the copyright on history. You're the, you're the imitator. As long as they're not saying that, and I don't hear them saying that, leave all the details to the historians to discuss and debate out of the political realm and carry on with the, the real vision here of advancing this entire region. Uh, it's a worthy vision into the European Union, into NATO, uh, fortunately North Macedonia and Bulgaria, both NATO allies. And that's, that's the vision and that can be achieved. Please. Thank you, thank you, Ed. I, 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 I simply, the, the order of the, of the talk is that Mr. Mayor is the next one. And uh, he's coming to Okrit only a few days after the uh, French president and Macedonian prime minister had a very constructive meeting from what I heard here from, from my sources, more than two hours. And I'm sure that Mr. Mayor, being in politics very long and being in international relations also very long, he is an ex-diplomat among other things, can reflect upon the European values and the uh, you know, need for respect, need for, uh, it, Constructional intervention and how European Union treats these problems like we have now. Please. Yes, thank you, Susha. I don't. I'm not sure it's a gift to ask me to speak after an English and an American colleague. For French, it's a bit demanding, but I try to do my best. Um, uh, just before you talked, I was a bit surprised by the the tone of the discussion because it's about uh, moving targets. It's about moment of despair, uh, lost hopes, and so on. And uh, it's true that uh, if, we've got, if we stay in this kind of mood, meaning we are submitted to the institutions, to the atmosphere, and uh, what has been proven by uh, uh, Mr. Zaev is that we can change. We can change the move, we can change the perceptions, we can change also the vision of a country like North Macedonia from, from Europe. And as you rightly say, there is a crisis here in the Balkans. There are political crises in different countries in the Western Balkans. There is a crisis also within the EU. But the point is not about, okay, do we have, I would say, um, I would say, do we lost opportunities? Do we want to create an environment, a decision, I would say a vision to fight? I mean, we need fighters. Uh, what happened in the 50s, what happened in 70, it is at each moment of truth of the EU, there were fighters. So we're going to fight, and we fight. And on the French side, I heard some reproaches about the fact that we didn't take our responsibilities uh, two years ago. Frankly speaking, I won one of those putting pressure on the French administration to make it happen. But I understood really that things were not going in the wrong direction because it was a fake negotiation, even with Serbia now. Uh, and even with Montenegro, it's kind of fake negotiation. People pretend to act, EU pretend to look at the efforts, but we do not see any momentum, any dynamics. So do we want this scenario to be replicated to Albania and Northern Macedonia? It was a question mark. And Macron says, no, we want to make it serious. We want to make things happen. We want to put more capital in the discussion. Because otherwise, at the end of the day, it will not be accepted. You know, when it's about wishful thinking, remember the European Convention in 2000, 2005, then we go to referendum, and because it was kind of, I would say, compromise of, uh, I would say, good sentiments, it was rejected by people because there was not, I mean, the force and the, the balance and the implication of political forces in this process. So we need to make it happen. Uh, on this side, my feeling is that uh, Northern Macedonia has strong assets 
and not only a press bar, of course, it's most visible, no right, but also a read agreement, uh, meaning that there is an example in this country that we can man manage nationalities in the long run, and, we, and that provides stability to the environment. And the fact that these efforts have been made means that what happened in the mind of uh, President Biden is also present in the mind of every EU leader. And, and frankly speaking, when I look at the dynamics behind this, uh, I would say, 18 months of uh, delay additional, I understand that the political clock is ticking and it's not, I would say, compatible with the EU way of delivering uh, achievements. Fully, fully share this view. We have elections going on every, uh, all, all the time. But what is sure is that the, there is a huge consensus about the fact that this country made the right efforts and everybody coalizes behind you. And it, for me, it's not, so it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when, and my guess is the when will not be very long. Why so? Because there is so much to lose on the other side, on the side of our Bulgarian colleagues. I mean, they need uh, EU support, of course, politically speaking, financially speaking, they need support. And the, the reputation and the, the, the convergence of Bulgaria, I, mean, I, I speak very frankly, huh? Uh, to the EU is very much, I would say, disputable. And our vision for the French presidency coming on after the Slovenian one, because we start in, in January, that we will do all what we can to help Slovenian presidency to achieve this goal before, before the French presidency. And why so? We are also to be very clear about the political dynamics in our countries, because there is no consensus in our countries to, to make these bets of enlargement. Uh, so it's true that half of the population of France, as an example, the Republicans, to put it simply, are against for the moment. And why are they against? Not for bad reasons only, but also for good reasons. Uh, they are against because they do not see that convergence has been the result of the previous accession process. They say that what we know, I, I like the word of balkanization, uh, of, of the EU, that is true, there is a risk of balkanization, and it's part because of the, I would say, the anthropic uh, way of, uh, bureaucratic way we, we administer this, this institution, but it's also because of, I would say, lack of fighters uh, who really want to address the difficult topics. So, put it simply in the perspective of next year, uh, are we serious when we, we say that uh, we start a negotiation with a lot of political involvement, with a new approach, a new methodology, which really, for us, gives the impression that things are going in the right direction. And secondly, do we reward our, your countries to be engaged in this, in this path? And to put it very simply, uh, when, when government complain, coming from this region, saying to the population, you know, we make the efforts, we are not, uh, compensated by these efforts. And though we wait, we are on the queue index. I think it's a, it's a lose-lose situation because it creates only distance and Europe is seen as a constraint. What we want to achieve and what we want to build together with you with this new process is really to say to people, when we negotiate, we know it destabilizes the country, we know it, it unveils corruption practices, clans and so on, so, it has a very negative impact on the balance of society. We know it very well. So, what, what we give in exchange? So, new procedure, and this is the idea, give in exchange means to, to reward the effort, not to wait for the 20 years to the accession, but, uh, or to 10 years, but to reward the effort immediately by closing, I would say, chapters and being able to implement policies with financial consequences directly to people in order to build this political support and to help this government to win. So really, this is, this is what is to happen. It's not a given. What we see is even when we decide it, there is a kind of, I would say, uh, come back to usual habits, it's very rapid, so we have to fight it together. But we think it's a need. Last point. Uh, in this perception from the Western, I would say, side, it's true that the big question mark is in what camp uh, will, uh, 
northern Macedonia and western Balkan B. In this confrontation which is rising, where you have some countries like, you know, uh, Hungary, uh, like, you know, uh, Poland, it's a very big question. Um, if the impression is that the sponsor of this accession are those who want to benefit from this Balkanization, there will be a blockade for sure. So my guess is that, uh, that it's not about marketing, it's about, okay, what is the meaning for, for, for these candidates to join EU? If the meaning is to benefit from the single market and from competition, from research funds and from our structural funds, it will be not motivating. If it's an added value to manage our challenges, to address our difficulties related to, I would say, regional integration, stabilization, migration, uh, even terrorism, um, values, rule of law, uh, fight against corruption, then, then you are on the solution side. And this is really what we need to, I would say, to, to push and to create together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to remind everyone we have a free chair here. I already have a few people who are waiting to sit there. So please, some of the participants, when the chair is filled, somebody would leave. Uh, before I actually give uh, the, the last word for the panelists or the golden fishes in the bowl, uh, which, which will go to Ms. Ms. Uh, Corina Stratulat on, through the video, I would like maybe to ask, uh, first of all, the deputy foreign uh, Minister of Turkey to sit at the chair. You will have two to three minutes, then Simonida Katsarska, then I have Christoph Bender. So please, people, just take your seats because the, 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 these golden fishes are leaving. And then we go to Stratulatu, and then we proceed with uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister from Turkey. Um, do we have Ms. Stratulatu on the, Ms. Stratulatu on the, on the video link, please? Yeah. Yeah, please see it and you can, yeah, yeah, please. Do we have the video link? Okay, instead of waiting, I mean, when it comes, it will be gladly uh, put it on. Uh, yes, I think that we are moving uh, to the video link. Yes. Yes. Hello. I can hear you quite well. I don't know if you can hear we, me. We can hear you perfectly. We do not have, to have a picture, but pictures are just... Okay. If it was up to the pictures, I would never be a moderator to this panel. So please go on and we'll, we'll right. hear your, well, your, your talk. It's, it's okay. Um, good, good morning, almost good afternoon. Um, and, uh, and of course, thank you so much for, um, for the invitation and for your flexibility uh, to accommodate my presence uh, remotely. Um, I'm not only um, a golden and invisible fish, uh, but uh, also a virtual one. Uh, so, now we can uh, see you. Now we can see you. Uh, so this is quite an extraordinary situation, a little bit like um, uh, the situation that we are, uh, we've been discussing uh, with, with your guests this morning. Um, and look, my, my contribution is not going to uh, be anything new uh, or um, much more positive than uh, what we have heard so far. But if we are to assess uh, the point uh, at which we are uh, in uh, the enlargement process, then, um, you know, uh, we're going to repeat um, and we're going to say uh, what has to be said, even if it means repeating ourselves and, and being critical and, and, and somewhat um, uh, gloomy. So I will... Um, I'll just start by saying that, yeah, uh, stating the obvious, that enlargement is, uh, is an intergovernmental dossier where, um, where the EU capitals have the last word uh, on all decisions. And this is a prerogative that um, the member states do not shy away from, from exercising, as we have seen um, far too many times uh, over the past years. Um, given the, the huge implications, internal implications that uh, admitting new members um, can have, uh, it is hardly surprising that uh, existing EU countries uh, have the right and indeed uh, want to use the right to, to say who gets in and want, under what conditions. The paradox, however, is that national governments could wreck the process if they interfere too much 
and if they interfere on grounds that are unrelated to agreed standards and procedures. And this is precisely what ha we've been witnessing. Uh, we've seen an increase uh, in national safeguards and mechanisms to steer uh, and conduct the, um, uh, and control the conduct of enlargement. We've seen more instances uh, in which uh, the General Affairs Council and the European Council simply uh, ignore or overrule the Commission's opinion. And we've seen a growing influence of domestic politics at key moments of decision making in the process. And of course, preoccupations that have been influencing uh, the enlargement agenda in unpredictable ways and with uncertain outcomes uh, over the past years don't have to do only with bilateral disputes between EU countries and Balkan uh, neighbors. Uh, they also include concerns about um, immigrants, about asylum seekers, about the sustainability of welfare systems, um, about unresolved statehood issues in the region, and increasingly also um, about distrust in European institutions, especially the Brussels executive and the integration process more generally. And all this makes the entire enlargement process more dependent on political developments in the member states than on progress in the Balkan countries, according to Brussels-based institutions, which is not good. We know it's not good. We've been saying this for, you know, at least the past decade that, that, that this is not good because the success of enlargement policy over the, uh, the past three decades is largely due to the role that conditionality uh, plays in encouraging aspiring countries to transform themselves in order to meet these uh, EU standards. And this conditionality, of course, only works if it is consistent and if it is credible. And if one or several member states interfere with it, they undermine it. And when conditionality is undermined, the credibility of enlargement is undermined, and so is the transformative uh, leverage that the EU has uh, over the Balkan countries. The bad news, I think, is that it is unlikely that the member states will change their attitude um, in the near future. So when you ask um, in your title what to expect when you're expecting, unfortunately, I'm tempted to say that more of the same. Um, and why? More of the same, first of all, because change would mean ensuring that the EU lives up to its own lofty rhetoric and promises delivering to the Balkan countries uh, when rewards are due, like in the case of North Macedonia and Albania now. So really respecting the, the merit-based approach of the process. But disciplining EU countries that depart in functional terms or resisting the temptation of allowing national politics to bear on the position of individual countries um, uh, on, uh, the, um, in the Council of the European Union is not easy in practice, and we've seen it. And of course, the unanimity requirement doesn't help here, but it is very unclear uh, whether it will be transformed into QMV uh, anytime soon. And second, um, more of the same because uh, change would also require a better toolkit to affect reform on the ground. We, we, we all know that the member states hold the bar very high um, for the Balkan countries and are quick at diagnosing problems in the region. But when it comes to offering solutions, despite the Commission's best efforts and, and despite the efforts also of, of other EU institutions and bodies, I think that the EU still lacks effective, properly effective means to engender good governance and socio-economic development um, in, in the Balkans. The member states will continue to have big asks from the Balkan countries. I don't see how that can change. And I also don't see how they'll come up with solutions anytime soon to help the region live up to, uh, uh, to, to these big expectations uh, and ensure the convergence of which we're speaking. Hence, um, at least for these two reasons, but probably there are more, 
I'm rather pessimistic about seeing change, at least if change involves and refers to the member states and how they're handling um, currently the enlargement process. Of course, and this comes a bit in reaction to what we've heard from our uh, guests from the United States, the EU is not the United States. It is a union of 27 different member states. And what the EU is trying to achieve in the Balkans and with the Balkan country is a real development project. It's consolidating, establishing and consolidating democracy, building states, um, building functioning uh, democracy, democ uh, functioning economies, and all of that, of course, um, it's, it's, it can't happen overnight. It's not, it's not easy. Um, I, will have course, to, I will have to, Corina, I, I'm sorry, because we are running out of time here, and you very bravely presented uh, a very necessary view on this panel, which is a pessimistic view, because you know politicians mostly want to underline the optimistic tones when we are discussing about the future. So thank you very much for that. But I'm having a long queue of people who would like to add a couple of more minutes. I'm going to give the floor to Ed for a very fast intervention. I think that it is related to our French uh, friend, and then we're going to go with the Turkish uh, Turkish Deputy Foreign Minister with Simonida. With then then we will follow the the, the queue. With the permission of the Turkish Deputy Foreign Minister, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, make it a bit of a discussion because the, uh, our colleague here uh, just mentioned and sort of the difference between the U.S. and the EU. Let me qu quickly say two things. Number one, so if how can an American then have this perspective? Oh, you know, you're, you, uh, be critical of the European Union as. as uh, Corinna correctly pointed, it's a, it's a union, it's in progress, 27 members, et cetera. I'll tell you very simply, we can. The U.S. has its own problems in its neighborhood. If, if we want to make an analogy, it's not exact at all, but we have great difficulties in Central America. We have, it's a, a region that is in turmoil, that has a lot of out-migration, that comes to our borders, and it's very difficult to, uh, uh, for us to resolve. What's the difference with the EU? And this is why the analogy is useful. What's the difference? These countries in Central America can never become part of the United States, number one. It's, it's impossible. Uh, it's neither an aspiration or it's nowhere on the agenda. Number two, when the United States talks to these countries, they call the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. There's, and, and we have to be aware that the conditions in these countries are severe. There's tremendous gang violence. You don't have that in the Balkans. We have very serious ethno-national divisions that were once uh, violent, and who knows, we hope certainly never again would be. But these are very serious conditions. Here, the out-migration is caused by basically the collapse, the, the failure of this European project to, to proceed, and the lack, here from the, we hear from the youth, the lack of belief anymore. So that's another difference that we have. And here's the third, the most important difference, U.S. versus the EU. In our, our troubled neighborhood, your troubled neighborhood. When we, the United States, talk to these countries, these very troubled countries in our region, we have to be very careful how we speak to them. We cannot tell them, as Americans, we cannot go to El Salvador and say, you need to do this, and you need to clean up corruption. And you need to pass these laws. We cannot say that. We have a troubled history, imperialistic history. What is the EU, the situation with the EU? Completely different. Completely different. <laughs> the EU ha is the member, ha they want to join the EU, and the EU has every right and every ability to say, you need to clean up corruption. You need to pass these laws. And guess what? M that's accepted in the region. So I, I simply don't accept this notion that, uh, oh, the EU is a work in progress, et cetera. The EU can deal with this region. It's uh, mainly and primarily, it's a problem of intra-EU divisions. They can be overcome. And uh, it is up to the EU to really take ownership Thank you. finally. Thank you, Thank you I, I think that you made a very good introduction for the deputy Turkish foreign minister, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kaimakci, uh, yes, I think it's functioned. So please, you have two to three minutes. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me into your bowl of fish. So among, you know, some golden fish, I hope I will not be seen as a shark. <laughs> because sometimes Turkey is seen as a shark in the Balkans, although we are also internal, integral part of the Balkans, 
as a Balkan country. Uh, also, you know, some comments about malign actors in the region. Sometimes Turkey is also added uh, to this list of uh, Russia, China, and uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia sometimes. So first, I mean, we belong to this uh, area. Uh, my British colleague was upset with the map. I have to confess also I am one of those who's a little bit upset with this map. Of course, if you mean the EU, okay, but uh, if we talk about Europe, I think the UK, despite the fact that Brexit happened, we are still in Europe. <laughs> and uh, Turkey is, uh, you know, one of the countries uh, also that want to join. And also in, in terms of the number, you had six seats, but let's not forget that there are seven potential candidate and negotiating candidate countries, including Turkey. So uh, I just wanted to underline this. And also the term Western, Western Balkans, I think it doesn't really sound well. Where is uh, Eastern Balkans? Where are Northern and Southern Balkans? There is no such a thing. If you want to make a distinction between Turkey and the rest of the candidate countries, tell us clearly. So let's do it this way. Uh, it maybe, is difficult. Maybe, maybe it is it's difficult. because of the size of the hotel, we couldn't accommodate Turkey in the, um, <laughs> in the building, you know. It's but <laughs> let's not forget that some of the hotels in this area are run by the Turkish companies. That's true, that's true. In the Balkans, you know, we have $20 billion of investment, at least $20 billion of uh, trade. So, uh, like my American colleague pointed out, you know, what is not uh, done by the EU actually is being done by, by Turkey, but this should not be seen uh, as a threat or as a destabilizing factor. But this is for the development, for the stability of this region altogether towards the EU membership. My EPC colleague, I think, mentioned very clearly, but I will make it you know, clearer. The essential problem in the enlargement process, and I am saying this as the most experienced candidate country since 59, 1959. The essential problem is the abuse of the veto right for national purposes and the nationalization of the enlargement policy within the EU. This is the problem. If we had had open chapters 23, chapters 24 about you know, the basic fundamental values of, of the EU, today Turkey's situation would have been completely different. If we could have accept, you know, I mean, open more chapters with the negotiating and the candidate countries in the past, I think Northern Macedonia, Albania, Serbia, Montenegro would have been completely in a different situation. Why we are blocking the whole process at the beginning for our, you know, narrow-minded national interest, which may not be in the interest of, of Europe, it, which may not be in the interest of all of us. Mr. Kaibachi, so, we will have to close the... I will just say two words. I think we should enjoy the benefits of the process. Process is important. Let's start the process. If you want to impose your veto right, do it at the end. But let's not kill the process. And this is vital. And also, the, in, in terms of EU institutions, we have to see more assertive European Commission defending the interest of Europe. Now we have council. Intergovernmentalism prevailing in the EU, and I hope it will not need, lead to nationalism. And this is this is uh, this is a, you know this is an important point in my belief. Deputy Prime Minister said about something about hope, and we have a Turkey saying, you know, no loss no loss of hope until the body dies. But <laughs> even if the body dies, we know that there is hope even after life. Yes, so, of course. Thank you very thank much. You. That's, uh, that's a very uh, perfect combination of pessimism and optimism, I have to say, <laughs> which is a uh, you know, traditional Turkish delight, I would say, and deepness of, of thought, of course. Simonida, I, I'm, just, I'm just notifying everything, that everybody that we are going to prolong the session for 10 minutes because we started some 15 minutes later. But please keep around three minutes. So. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, yes, for having me the... for the second time. I'm just going to respond to a couple of issues that were mentioned. Alternatives were mentioned, and we at the European Policy Institute, we tend to highlight this for the last two years. We live in an alternative. We live in an actual alternative to the, access, to the regular accession process. And this is our life for 30 years now. We have to grasp that because I started my previous intervention with the lifetime. 
So the question is for how long can this alternative survive and what can we make, what can we make to make the pro this alternative better? Convergence was mentioned um, as well in terms of the enlargement process. There's a footnote in a World Bank study that not many countries have ever achieved con convergence. It takes a long time and I think I would rather not kill the process that was also mentioned here with saying that convergence was not achieved after 15 years or so on. We have Estonia, we have other bet countries which performed better through the enlargement process. We can't, I think it's counterproductive for everyone if we focus on the countries that we consider have not uh, performed well. The methodology was also mentioned and I think that we, with all of the concerns that we had around that methodology, the key tests to the performance of the methodology are North Macedonia and Albania. I think we can't shy away from that. There's no, the reframing which might yet come through Serbia and Montenegro is not the real test of the process. If we go back to the foundations of the actually functioning conditionality, this was the one country which was supposed to, to show whether the conditionality of the European Union will succeed if you have a recent change of a government that would like to democratize a society and that has responded very well to European Union conditionality in the past when there was an outcome. We cannot forget that this is at this point a country that's comparably aligned with Serbia and Montenegro and has not started the accession negotiations. And we will bang with this as much as we can, which, mean, which means that there was some purpose to this process before when it was actually functioning. Last point, we need it's evident that we need a new narrative. If there's no accession negotiations then, but this has to come, repeating to what I said before, it has to come through engaging with all of the European Union institutions, with the commission, the commission was mentioned here, but not only through the engineer. We have our institutions which need to engage with their counterparts because the European Union, as Tim Judah said, will be different. We are now for the first time also in our circles of, the, of uh, think tanks, discussing openly of differentiated integration, which was a blasphemy in 2007, <laughs> 8, 9. But we have to engage with this discussion to have a meaningful process, because if we are just start, stuck here, then it, there's no purpose. Thank you. It. Thank you very much, Simoliva. Please, everyone who is joining the circle, just uh, say your name and, uh, you know, a short uh, who you are, where you're coming from. Christoph, I know you, so please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sasha. I'm Christoph Bender. I'm with the European Stability Initiative a think tank focusing on Southeastern Europe. I think we have a very, very serious problem with the succession process and not only related to North Macedonia, but in general. The, the constant blockages by different EU member states on issues completely unrelated to the acquis, to the um, membership criteria have dramatically worn down the credibility of this process. It's losing trust, as Nikola Dimitrov put it just um, before. The process has also ceased to trigger reforms in those countries who are actually inside the process. So if you look at the so-called front runners, Montenegro, Serbia, it's very difficult to say today, are they actually moving forward or are they moving backwards? It's also difficult to see that this dynamic will change anytime soon. Yeah? So, so I think we, we, we run a very, very serious risk that this process slides further into irrelevance yeah, and will just die a slow, painful death. At ESI, we have been pondering about this, this, this problem for quite a while, and the, the, sort of the only way out we see is that we, we keep um, full membership as the overall goal, but that we need an, an, an interim goal for the Western Balkans or the Southeast European countries that is ambitious, meaningful, and reachable. Uh, ideally, that would be membership in the European Union single market. This covers most of the acquis. It's not an alternative, it's not a deviation, but it lies actually full speed on the way towards membership. You know, it's like if you drive to, 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 to Skopje and you just stop for a coffee in Tetovo, right? Um, it's actually following the path of Sweden, Austria, and Finland, you know, who yeah. at the time also were not allowed to join because you know, it was not so, there was quite some resistance to accepting new members, so they joined first the single market which then allowed them to relatively quickly join as full members once the conditions were better. Um, it's also attractive. Point? It's attractive, you know, Norway pays to be part of that. But for this to happen, you need basically, we need clear criteria, you know, what need the countries to do. We have the European Commission to monitor this closely. And I think what is very crucial, it should be open to all EU member states, regardless of the status. 
former that's, status in the process. So also to Kosovo and Bosnia. And I think that's, that's the most promising way to get out of this current conundrum, strengthening reformers, strengthening the EU's influence in the region, which is very clearly declining. And, and the hope. And, and filling this process with, with meaning mm. and purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Please. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just mixing okay. gender also, so. Well, then why did you get all these really tall chairs for women <laughs> that could continue to be not uncomfortable for women, especially? Um, uh, my name is Una Haidari. I'm a journalist, and I've covered the um, Mas issues related to North Macedonia, both the name, um, the name uh, referendum and the sub subsequent NATO um, uh, membership, as well as the more recent issues relating to uh, the uh, language debate with Bulgaria. And today, like when I was preparing to come here to um, both attend and speak, um, I was uh, talking to my editor about like what we could have as a story that would come out of this. Like, what would the article be? And at this point, the process is so up in the air. Frankly, after the Bulgarian election, something completely different com could come out. A dialogue similar to what is this is highly unlikely, but a dialogue that is similar to what uh, Kosovo and Serbia are going through. You know could emerge out of this to solve the language issue because it does not seem to be going anywhere. And that in itself is, is extremely frightening. I mean, the people in this room are all experts and journalists and they all cover these things closely and so we still have, all have some comfort and find some comfort in the, in the process itself. But imagine what this is like for citizens when they have absolutely no understanding about where this process could go. Um, I interviewed uh, uh, Eddie Rama um, uh, last, last month. Um, it hasn't come out yet, so I'm not sure exactly. But when I spoke to him about this, you know, um, the whole uh, accession process, um, I'll mention an anecdote from the interview since there's the t name of the panel itself is very anecdotal. Um, he said, I asked him about, you know, this, this being delayed all the time. He said, it's like preparing for a wedding and then having the wedding delayed all the time over and over and over again, except now we've stopped organizing a party afterwards. We just we don't, we don't, we don't, we're not gonna celebrate. And that, that's what it is. It encapsulates that feeling of if and when some f form of um, progress is made, it, it will have drained both the citizens and the political sphere. Um, I will be wrapping up soon. Yes. Um, my, <laughs> everyone else got more time. Um, and my uh, main thing I just like to stress out, stress on this is, I feel like it's really, um, the EU can't just say this is a bilateral issue and pull out and not, not, not do anything directly. I mean, it's completely irresponsible and it takes away the responsibility that they have towards the countries that are changing uh, to enter uh, uh, the European Union. If they, you know, being a Macedonian a, a politician or an Albanian politician at the time and having to stand up in front of your people all the time, say, delay it over and over again, if they expect these people to defend the EU in front of their, their citizens, then the EU has to stand up for them too. Thank you. Um, I, I just have to announce that I'm closing the bowl, so these people who are here are going to be our last speakers, because we have 10 more minutes and we have five speakers. So my message is very clear, two minutes each. I think, I <laughs> thank think you. Two minutes is enough. Yes, thank you. Um, these chairs are really uncomfortable, by the way, and yeah, I want I to know, file a complaint that's why I'm standing with the here. organizers, because it's just I, I feel like a flamingo. Um, Anyway, my name is Alexander Brezer. I'm a journalist. I cover the region. I used to work as a EU correspondent from Brussels for one of the regional public broadcasters. And, you know, this, this event seems like, you know, one of those alcoholic anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> meetings where we're all like, hi, I'm Bosnian and I'm uh, hi, whatever, Alexander. Macedonian and or what have you, Montenegrin. And it it's all feels like this big joke where I'm, I'm, all of us walk into a bar and nothing ever happens. <laughs> so, I really, I don't know. There are several things that I'd like to address, and I'm going to stand up because this is turning into a stand-up comedy routine, I think, slowly. Um, look, I think some, uh, one thing that I would like to add, so I'm going to use my two minutes very um, carefully. One thing that I'd like to add that I don't think God mentioned is that current EU, there are current EU member states, there are current EU members, that would not fulfill the requirements that are expected from the Western Balkan Six if they were to attempt and, um, you know, go through the whole accession process right now. And they're the ones who are determining our futures while we are the ones standing on the outside, cracking jokes about ourselves, you know, airing our grievances again. And I think that's extremely unfair to the point that I'm 
obviously clearly getting anxious, so I'll just pass the mic to someone else. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. So let's, you have your two minutes, then we'll go there, yes. and then we'll finish the circle. You, you will be next, and we'll finish the, the circle with the young generation. Well, um, maybe this is my turn in the AA meeting. So uh, <laughs> my name is Egli Sakelari, and I'm an, an undergraduate student at the Balkan Slavic and Oriental Studies in Thessaloniki. And jokingly enough, I uh, would like to expand my thoughts on what the last commenter said about uh, us or plain civilians being outside of the box in these conversations. So I would like to address the type of diversity and unity and how this paradigm is one of the core values of the European Union. And I would like to say that to me these are direct concepts of uh, implementing, implementing rule of law and re-establishing re the, um, uh, the credibility of the European Union in the region. And I would like to uh, add my personal view on how can we really coexist with our neighbors if we cannot accept their individualities, but instead we simply tolerate them. So firsthand, I have witnessed uh, relations of tolerance between uh, Greek locals and North Macedonian tourists. Uh, so it is actually uh, a tragedy or a, I don't know, a farce, because uh, how can we achieve the, the necessary level of trust in uh, institutional decisions and initiatives when we simply don't, uh, when we're not part of them and we, when we cannot press for their uh, implementa uh, implementation. Uh, when we think of ourselves as bystanders and when we turn our backs uh, really to our neighbors. So actually what I wanted to say is that we have to move further from our privileged positions as uh, political or at least aspiring political scientists in this, uh, uh, this area, in this room. And uh, we have to focus on the really ignorant and apathetic position and behavior that takes place outside of this room. And how can we address and inspire trust, really, to uh, people among us who have no idea uh, where North Macedonia is located? And they're actually uh, southern Greeks. <laughs> they're not uh, part of, uh, I don't know, a US uh, member uh, city. So um, I think that we have to raise some questions and our concerns about uh, our good neighborly uh, behaviors and uh, activities, and uh, maybe uh, engage and uh, promote, advocate the good neighborly relations through cultivating a culture of uh, inclusion, uh, integration, as the European values uh, propose, and uh, yeah, maybe find either disciplinary ways of uh, that's, uh, achieving this uh, diversity that's, and unity that's, standards. That's a very good point. Yeah, thank and you. Very clear, you made. Yeah, so thank you. thank you for that. It's it's very good addition thank to you the for your time. very rich discussion. So please. Thank you, Sasha. Um, very briefly, I will just pick up something which Alexander Breza was was pointing out. I mean, we have to. I think be more honest in the European Union about our fellow member states. And I think this is fundamentally the problem. I mean, the European Union was founded among the assumption that they're democratic and that they have a sincere will to cooperate. Um, and we're seeing a number of member states who are not doing it. They're not democratic. I mean, Hungary is not a democracy anymore. We have EU member states which are not democratic um, and others which are sliding towards that and who are insincere about the will to cooperate with each other as well as towards future member states. And we have to change the European Union about this. It's not just about changing the, the, the voting mechanism, of course it's about that, but it's about member states who are committed to democracy standing up and saying we cannot tolerate in our midst undemocratic countries who fundamentally undermine what the European Union stands for and which leads to the blockade of North Macedonia which leads also to the fact that those who are in favor of democracy and rule of law are skeptical towards those outside of the EU who actually deserve to be let in because they are regretful about what is happening within the European Union. But the problem is the accession process can never resolve this. Backsliding can happen at any point. So the EU has to change within. This is not, I don't mean this in the sense of the excuse which some governments have been saying, well, we first have to reform and then we can enlarge. No. They have to happen in parallel, but we have to be much more honest. And the member states, I mean, uh, like Germany, like Austria, like Italy, others who have to also actually not just say, we regret that Bulgaria has vetoed. We regret we will try again in six months. This is not enough. We have to find alternative ways and put the full weight 
of those member states who are committed to democracy and sincere cooperation on the others to say this has to stop. Florian Bieber, always up to the point, what can I say? Thank you very much for this intervention. We go there and then we finish with our two younger guests. Please. Yeah. Let me yes, okay. My name is Dirk Jan Kop. I'm the ambassador of the Netherlands in North Macedonia. Um, I feel I have to react at this point. What our American friend comfortably forgets is that uh, the diff one difference with Europe is that Alabama has no veto right over the foreign policy in Washington towards Honduras. Bulgaria has. It's called the rule of law. Whether you like it or not, those are our rules. And Bulgaria is using it. Um, rule of law for me is much more important than a word like respect, which I usually reserve for mafia bosses. The other, the other big difference with the United States is that the already great European experiment got a whole new dimension uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And since then, uh, we are in an enormous development that is nearing its completion to get Europe prosperous and to get it secure. And that means make these countries members of NATO and make them members of the European Union. Um, in the meantime, in the meantime, not the United States of America, but we have been cleaning up the mess in Europe left behind by the communists. Not only with words, with enormous amounts of money. And that massive support has stretched also to this region. So now to talk about betrayal and abandoning when we fail to meet one date, when there is one hiccup in the road. Look at the past years and the progress that has been made. What is worrying though is that the recent poll in this country showed that 56% of the people uh, are of the opinion that the government cannot achieve its go goals without outside pressure. This is a country that has been independent for a generation and is a sovereign state. This is a basic problem in this region that somehow, unlike, let's say, the Baltic region, uh, it doesn't manage to be the master of its own destiny. There is a Chinese saying that says, why do you hate me? I didn't help you. And we are here standing uh, in the middle of this, absolutely ready to help where we can, absolutely determined to get this region inside, inside the European Union. But uh, to talk about historical mistakes and betrayal is, well, it is absurd. Thank you. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I'm almost sorry that I closed close the discussion after your intervention because I'm sure that we could have gone now for the next three hours discussing some of the oh, points please, you please. made. <laughs> Thank you. It was very valuable. At least it was a reality check on some of the ideas that we sometimes want to nourish, uh, not being uh, enough realistic to understand that the level of um, you know various views in Europe is very rich and sometimes unpleasant to some of the positions that we held in the Balkans. Okay, let's proceed. Who has the microphone? Where is the... Yeah, can, can you go and then... Uh... Okay, uh, can, okay. Okay, so basically what I want to do... Uh, I mean, firstly, my name is Nikola Donev. I'm from the law faculty, Justinianus Primus in Skopje, and currently serving as president of the Committee of Science. Uh, at the University Student Assembly of St. Cyril and Methodius University, and also studying international law, which I think comes with the name, uh, probably. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is mainly uh, our sort of processes that are contradictory and sometimes uh, parallel, that is quite characteristic of the Balkans. One is our process of reconciliation. We still face um, a lot of inter-ethnic divisions that need to be resolved firstly here, and also in parallel we need to proceed with uh, our Europeanization and actually become citizens of Europe, uh, which in itself is, uh, is a long and tenacious process. But I am sure that we have the capacity. I've seen young people um, rise above everything and uh, in support of 
uh, in support of this uh, EU integration of, of Northern Macedonia. And also I would like to talk about uh, educational exchange. Although we, uh, our universities are integrated in the common European credit transfer system, the PRESPA agreement allows for a wide um, exchange of ideas and students between North Macedonia and Greece. And it's part of the PRESPA agreement, it's like only five, um, five articles in there, but they need to become co a core part of the implementation of the agreement because only through exchange of ideas, technologies, and um, also, let, let's not kid ourselves, Greece has some wonderful universities, Macedonia has a lot of potential, and I think that implementing that core of educational exchange is necessary to show further that, the pre that PRESPA can be a model, not just for, uh, for political visionaries, but also that it can produce material uh, material inclusion between young people, and that is so important here. And th this is where I went. Thank you very much, because we, we tend to forget that people uh, in Greece and in Northern Macedonia actually do not know each other, especially youngsters. We want to believe that we, being Macedonians, going for summer holidays in Greece, that we know Greece, we know Giro, we know the beach, and we know the, you know, the, the, the whatever. Greeks are not coming to Macedonia in any significant numbers, not to mention younger people. They have a nice country, of course, they have enough places to go. But this connection and the whole idea of PRESPA of connecting young people was one of the bases. And I have to say that three years after the PRESPA agreement was signed, we do not see a real development in that area. And I don't know whether Mr. Dimitrov is behind me, but that should be noted. And we are expecting, sorry? Not anymore, so the important points are going in the air. So, But the fact of the matter is that very much we need we did that. We are going to our last participant, so please okay. introduce yourself. And Thank you. Uh, your can you hear my guess? Uh, I'm Ornella Solaku. I'm uh, from Greece. And uh, on the all uh, affirmation points of view, I would like to add mine too. As a student in a Greek university, but uh, with the origin from Albania, um, since the Western Balkan states left the communist regime and uh, leave the transition to democracy, even at an early stage, the next step was immigration. Immigration, especially in the countries that are, were already members for, in the European Union. Um, and uh, yet after so many years, it is constantly observed mainly by the media, the spread of xenophobia, which uh, in many cases results in the constitution, let's say, of racism in the society. Uh, my greatest concern about this issue is the fact that even after two or three generations of immigrants, a significant part of the European society continues to have stereotypes about the immigrants from uh, Western Balkans, let's say. Uh, to give an example, Personally, I have accepted such stereotypes um, because of my origin. However, the fact that I have uh, been more, that uh, I have been in Greece um, since I remember myself and I'm more familiar with the Greek way of living than the Albanian. And um, my background gives me the opportunity to fully understand the importance of good relations between uh, the societies and uh, maybe the first step of good cooperation between societies and the second phase uh, is the cooperation between governments because um, in my opinion only through uh, social acceptance will the integration of the countries of the Western Balkans uh, be smooth. Well, that's all. There is no you. higher point to end this discussion than yours. So thank you very much. Uh, I see that the Dutch ambassador and then Ed Joseph will have a lot to talk in the lobby. So I, we can also put chairs around them and then follow the discussion. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for a very rich discussion. I would especially like to thank to Ms. Tena Prelets, who is going to be our rapporteur to the last session and hope to see you in the corridors. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, there is a time for a family photo, so whoever is here still, you're invited. Thank you.
Thank you.